For something so eccentric, Mother 3 is a very sobering game. In my previous video on Mother 2, aka Earthbound, I talked about how childhood prepares us for adulthood. I described dealing with all the sadness in the world as a battle against Gygus that adults have to play out every day. The basic plot of Mother 2 is that Gygus essentially made everyone, human and animal alike, evil, and when Ness's party defeats it, everything is great again. Thematically, at least, Gygus is the reason Pokey's dad hits him and your dad isn't living with you and your mom. It's the reason for police brutality, prostitution, murder, thievery, alcoholism, fanaticism. Mother 2, to me, was about becoming an adult and learning to deal with all of those things emotionally. I said in the video that a kid doesn't understand why all of these things happen. To them, it may as well be the work of some evil entity controlling everything. It may as well be Gygus. Well, as adults, we know that this isn't the case. Child abuse, police brutality, prostitution, murder, thievery, alcoholism, fanaticism, that's all on humanity. Enter Mother 3. Mother 3 is a game of multiple layers. On one level, you've got some very obvious anti-capitalist symbolism. That's basically all that needs to be said there. If you've played the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. However, the much more interesting and impactful side of the game is what you get when you relate it to Mother 2. In 2, Gygus was the source of all evil. In Mother 3, however, well, let's start at the beginning. Mother 3 opens up with our family in a beautiful island town in a pre-economic society, where everybody contributes and everybody's cared for. It's time for mom and the kids to go home after visiting grandpa's house, so they pack up and hike back down the mountain. On their way back, a group of UFOs start bombing the forest. If you're like me, you probably assumed that this was Gygus, back at it again with its old tricks. Well, over the next couple sections of the game, we learn that these UFOs are being flown by humans, but for all we know, it might still be Gygus who corrupted them. Anyways, Flint, our dad, beats a group of these pig masks, the humans piloting the UFOs, down, along with their deer chimera, while searching the forest for his wife and sons, and then this happens. Flint finds out that his wife died to save their sons from a Drago, and right in front of the kids, he starts attacking all of the people who helped in the search with this log from the campfire before being hit over the head by lighter and put in the town jail to sleep it off. So to recap, here's what the player's seen at this point. Humans making other humans do bad. No magical bee comes in from the future to assure us that this is all the work of Gygus, it's just humans. And the name of the song that plays when Flint attacks his friends? Confusion. After the funeral, Flint and Klaus go on separate hunts to get revenge on the Drago that killed Hanawa, the mom. Ultimately, Flint takes it down, and before delivering the killing blow, realizes that killing it would just do to its family what it did to our protagonists. Not only that, but we also see that it too was one of the pig masks' chimera, and with that, it's pretty indisputable that Gygus isn't the one making these once peaceful animals turn violent. It's the pig masks. It's humans. This first chapter, fittingly enough, serves as a perfect thesis statement for the whole game. All of the business with Osahe Castle and Facade and Salsa over the next two chapters isn't especially relevant yet. It's mostly just asking questions whose answers will be made more important much later, so we'll just skim over that for now. All we really need to go over is that we watch Facade endlessly torture a monkey that we happen to be controlling at the time, and that we learn that the pig masks are interested in Tasmili Village specifically because they want to find something called the Hummingbird Egg in Osahe Castle, and because they want to brainwash its citizens for some nefarious purpose. They do the former by rolling tanks all over the town graveyard, and they do the latter by essentially introducing greed into the town through Facade, trading one of the citizens some money, assuring him it's valuable, before then stealing it back and offering everybody happy boxes after that greed caused an argument. These happy boxes are just TVs from what I can tell, there's nothing special about them at all. The game doesn't really go into it much, but I can only assume that they just show the citizens what things are like in New Pork City, with cars and fast food and movie theaters and video games, so that they accept these changes and the pig mask army into Tasmili Village with open arms. Well, after all of that, we get to see the fruits of the pig mask's labor in Chapter 4, Club Tittyboo. Three years after Klaus went missing during his hunt for the Drago, and three years after Facade introduced Tasmili Village to the concept of an economy and the happy boxes, we see Tasmili transformed into a more or less modern town. The spunky, energetic music, the buildings and cars, the trains, the roads. We are in a town now, not a village, and these establishing shots we see of the new Tasmili, combined with that music, make it feel a lot more like Mother than the previous three chapters did. When I saw this scene, all I could think was, okay, we're back in Earthbound now. 
Only instead of Gygus, we have whoever Facade keeps calling on the phone. And instead of a meteor strike next to Ness's house, we have this giant crater next to Lucas's house. It's one of the first things we see once we get control of Lucas. Talking to these sheep reveals that the shed was struck by lightning, and going into the forest reveals that almost all of the quote-unquote antiquated parts of Tasmili are being ravaged by the same lightning strikes. The plot learned from exploring this town can basically be summed up as so. In the last three years, Facade got enough people to get happy boxes that the town was eventually able to accept all of this change, this indoctrination. Well, with a character named Duster having gone missing ever since the three-year time jump, his father and mentor recruits us to go look for him, with our only lead being that he might be a bassist in a band called DCMC, which plays at a pig mask operated restaurant called Club Titty Boo. Well, once we make it over there, we find out that we have to show a ticket in order to get into the club, and the only way to get a ticket is to work a shift at the local factory. There's no combat here, no wacky characters, no exciting visuals. We just have to spend about five minutes real time going down into the mines, pushing these golems onto a lift, and then going to a room to recharge them. All the while hearing people talk about how great Club Titty Boo is. And all I could think about was the song 16 Tons by Tennessee Ernie Ford. Which, when you realize that Club Titty Boo only accepts the currency you get from working at pig mask operated businesses, turns out to be a pretty apt analogy. Well, arriving at Club Titty Boo, a hard day of labor under our belts, we actually meet an old friend, Kumatora. She's working as a waitress at Club Titty Boo to keep an eye on Duster. Working this job, she and all the other girls are required to giggle after every sentence and wear these skimpy outfits, totally untrue to Kumatora's tomboy nature. We get to hear Duster's band, DCMC, play a song, similar to the Runaway 5 in Mother 2. Only where the 5 song was a fun, entertaining moment in Ness's story, DCMC plays a song called King P's Theme, which is a jazz rocky version of the same anthem that the Pig Mask broadcast all over the place during their conquests. This might all sound like cute, quirky, and typically disturbing Earthbound stuff, but let's take a step back and look at this for a moment. Here we have a factory where the workers' pay can only be used at businesses run by the same corporation. Girls are made to act like bimbos while guys are made to push rocks around all day. Their only relief is getting to spend some of their hard-earned money at a club owned by the same conglomerate, where they've all been conditioned to get excited to hear a state-sponsored band play what is essentially the national anthem for the country that treats them like this, all while the leader of this country sits back thinking of new ways to spend the money. This is a seriously messed up situation, and I'm not reading too far into things here. I mean, for God's sake, the army is literally called the Pig Masks, and their capital is called New Pork City. It's very clear that the game is trying to get across something with this, but rather than look at it solely as an anti-capitalist message, I think that looking at it as an example of the kind of evil that comes from humans is a much more interesting way of examining things, and one that fits with the themes of Mother 2 much better. Again, we'll skim over some stuff here because there just isn't enough time in a week for me to go over every little detail in the game. Our suspicions are confirmed that the pig masks are indeed responsible for ravaging the Tasmili area with lightning strikes in order to clear the land and to intimidate dissidents like young Lucas. And worst of all, we get to the Chimera Lab. The Chimera Lab is just messed up. This is in no small part due to the fact that it takes place in a generally fun, happy-looking Nintendo game, but the Chimera in and around this lab give me the perfect opportunity to talk about the genuine nightmare fuel that are the Chimera being created by the Pig Mask Army. Almost Mecha Lion, Batangatang, Cattlesnake, Horsantula, Mongolrus, Australophant, Squawking Stick, and of course the ultimate Chimera. I don't care who you are, these things are just creepy, especially Horsantula. They make me uncomfortable just looking at them. In Mother 2, Gygus, the physical embodiment of all evil and negativity, had you fighting things like the Mani Mani statue and the Boogie Tent, two of the creepiest enemies in the whole game. Here in Mother 3, however, plain old ordinary humans have you fighting against this nightmare fuel. While there are a lot of silly enemies in Mother 3, there are just as many creepy ones. The way that these animals are transformed into weapons or household utilities is one of the cruelest and creepiest things we see in the entire Mother series, and again, Gygus had nothing to do with it. It was all people. In fact, this game as a whole is much darker than any other Mother game. We've got Negative Man, this horribly depressed and hopelessly weak enemy if you can even call it that, which you might find yourself forced to beat up for no good reason. You've got all the very dark stuff with Master Porky, which we'll get into later. You've got straight up animal abuse, death and grief. The worst it got in Mother 2 was a bit of kidnapping and some police brutality. In Mother 2, as I've discussed before, the darkness was under the surface, always there but always in the background. 
In Mother 3, things are just dark, and that childlike whimsy is in the background, and again, no Gygus. The reason I keep bringing up the fact that Gygus has nothing to do with the plot of this game is simply because I think it's sort of critical to the whole point of the game. As I said in my Mother 2 video, that game was about coming to terms with the fact that there is evil in the world, and how the time we spend thinking about it as kids is what enables us to stand in its face as adults and not let it break us. However, there's one thing that I failed to mention in that video, something that Mother 3 confronts you with. Evil isn't just some magical force in the universe, it's something that's created almost exclusively by humans. As long as there are humans, there's evil. This is something that I think everybody learns before they become adults, but regardless, at some point in your life, you look at the world and you realize that for all of the messed up stuff we observe, just about every bit of it was created and perpetuated by humans. And then you realize one other thing. The most powerful humans, they tend to be out to get you, whether they realize it or not. Wage slaves, regular slaves, the homeless, addicts, victims of crime, whatever, every one of them could have been you if the wrong person had gotten their hands on you at the right point in your life. And if they're really slick, they'll use something like Facade's happy boxes to walk you to that broken point with a smile on your face. That's what happened to Klaus, Lucas's twin brother, and it could have just as easily happened to Lucas had he gone missing alongside Klaus. Lucas and Klaus are special. They're the only ones who are able to pull the seven needles, which keep dormant a dragon living under the island. We'll get into all of that later. For now, all we need to say is that Master Porky, the leader of the Pig Mask Army, wants to be the one to pull the seven needles, and so he needed Klaus on his side. What the Pig Mask Army turns Klaus into, the Masked Man, is pretty much the main emotional stake in the entire game. He's our most powerful foe, able to use all the same powers as Lucas and easily match our entire party of four all by himself. As the Masked Man, he doesn't have a single line of dialogue in the whole game. All he does is beat us down and pull the needles before we get the chance to. He knocks out our party members in one hit and he brutally wails on us without an inkling of feeling. Due to Klaus's brainwashing, he follows Master Porky's orders without saying a word or showing an ounce of emotion. He's exactly what Porky would like to turn all the inhabitants of the island into. He's the Pig Mask's employee of the month, and as Lucas's twin brother, it's impossible to ignore just how lucky it was that the exact same thing didn't happen to him. About 30 minutes ago at the time of writing, I was out on the town around 4am, bundled up in beanie and scarf, writing this very video. As I was packing up and heading back to the car, I passed a young homeless woman, carrying a pack that she could easily have fit herself into. She asked me if I had any drugs she could score, and if she could get a ride further into town. I said no to both, as she seemed a bit shiftier than the people I usually give rides to. I told her to stay warm and gave her a bottle of water that I had bought just in case my nice hot coffee dehydrated me. Then I got in my car, unbuttoned my jacket, put on my favorite album, got the heat going nice and hard, drove home, and made myself a sandwich. My dog piddled on the rug a bit when she saw me, and that was the worst thing to happen to me all day. All I could think about the whole time was that I could have just as easily been in her shoes, taking water from a stranger who only had it in case they got thirsty, and that all it would have taken was for the right people to have influenced my life at the right time. Whether those people were drug dealers or the people in power who decided it's okay for someone to be in a situation where they have to fend for themselves on a windy night in near freezing weather at a time in history where absolutely nobody is hiring. Even as I write this, she's walking towards the only 24-hour gas station near her, hoping to meet a stranger willing to hook her up with a fix to help her handle the cold. Sure, she's clearly made some mistakes, but she's a victim of humanity as much as anyone else. That's exactly what Mother 3 is about. The revelation that we all have at one point or another, that we're all in someone else's sights. Hell, this week alone I've gotten an email from one person claiming to have non-existent footage of me on some questionable websites demanding a ransom in Bitcoin, and another email from a so-called company who wanted me to sign a contract that would give them sole control of my YouTube revenue for a couple of years. Then there was another person just the other day pretending to be me on Discord, sending absolutely disgusting messages to minors under my name. People are messed up. Towards the end of Mother 3, it's revealed that this game actually takes place after Mother 2. So, what happened? Why does Tasmili start out with such outdated technology? Why are there no brick houses or skyscrapers or telephones or cars before the pig masks arrived? Well, humanity destroyed the world sometime after Mother 2. Probably global warming, maybe a nuclear war, or any number of other ways. Regardless, this island was the one place that would remain livable after the world's destruction, and the humans who were placed there were the sole survivors of all humanity. Well, them and Pokey, the neighbor kid who sided with Gygus in Mother 2, name retranslated to Porky in Mother 3. Porky, at the end of Mother 2, escaped to another time period before Ness could defeat him, and that time period was the one where Mother 3 takes place. Through his use of time travel, he's essentially become immortal, all without ever having a friend. 
Between that and his abusive parents, he's deteriorated to a state where he plans to destroy what remains of the world out of sheer boredom. The boredom of having never had somebody treat you nicely and not knowing how to make that happen. Stuck in an abusive household, it's no wonder he followed Gygus when it finally offered him some control over his life, and it's no wonder he turned out so bad. Humanity horribly wounded itself once, and now the same negativity that humans are so prone to has brought them to the brink of finishing themselves off. So what can we do? The enemies infiltrated our ranks. They aren't some natural force of evil in the universe, they're our brothers and sisters. Well, like the dynamic between the twins Lucas and Klaus, humanity isn't all evil. We've got some good in ourselves too. After all, Lucas's most powerful ability is named after something that Porky's government totally lacks. Love. This isn't a game about communism versus capitalism, it's a game about love and hate. We take down Porky, forcing him into his absolutely safe capsule, where nothing can hurt him but he can never leave to escape his boredom, and then it's on to the real final boss. The Masked Man. Klaus. Our brother. He beat our father down and now his sights are set on Lucas. The only one who threatens to stop him. After fighting for a while, Hinawa, our mother, speaks to us from beyond the grave, begging us to stop fighting, and we learn that fighting Klaus is useless. All we can do is sit there, taking his powerful hits while spamming abilities to keep us alive for longer, until eventually, Hunawa's love gets through to him and he removes the mask, before destroying himself with PK Thunder and dying in Lucas's arms. The dragon that sleeps under the island, kept dormant by the seven needles, it absorbs whatever's in the heart of whoever pulls the needles, be it love or hate. This dragon has the power to destroy what's left of humanity or to protect them. It isn't like Gygus, some all-powerful force of evil. It's controllable by humans. What it does is determined by humans. Humans in the right conditions can be pretty evil, so what can we do to handle this evil? Well, in the game, we can make sure that love is what wakes up the dragon and not hate, and as the post credit scene tells us, it isn't that different in our world. We live in a world where somebody is always preying on us. In Mother 2, we confronted that evil by having some fun in the face of it, by not letting it get us down. But we can't stop there. As individuals, most of us can't single-handedly change the whole world. But we can all do our part to make sure that the world we live in is one filled with love and not hate. So go out, and next time you get the opportunity, make someone's day better. You never know what it could lead to, what it could protect them from. You never know if your hate's gonna be the straw that eventually breaks the camel's back, or if your love's gonna be the water that keeps it going. A lot of people think that we're at a breaking point as a species. I don't know if that's true or not, but you can either worsen our situation with hate, or help fix it with love. You have that power, and it's time to use it. Go show the world some love. This video was made possible by people who showed me some love, so I'd like to go ahead and verbally thank my patrons, especially those donating $10 or more monthly, such as Alex Vanderwood, Almost Dead Again, Anatoly Volnov, Andrew Melnick, Big Time Jim, Colin Gajic, Cooper Sutton, Corbet Godwin, Cosmo Borsky, Daniel Christman, Darius Fazier, David Kaiser, Duncan Bristow, Fralem, Jack Eisenberg, Jano, John Strange, JP De La Tour, JW, Max Benning, Mixer Rules, Money and Muses, Celo, Silver Silence, Vladimir's Noldholm, Wolf HG, and Young Master Pig. As you can see, I've moved the patron readout to the end of my videos. I'm sorry if anyone feels badly about that, but I looked at my analytics and I saw that on my Bioshock 2 video, almost 50% of viewers left in the first 16 seconds, which I can only attribute to the patron read. Thanks again, guys.